Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Full Disclosure. And today we've got an amazing guest who is a leading authority on taxes, which for most of you listening or watching this is your largest household expense. And our discussion today is all about how to minimize or even eliminate your tax burden. And it's an absolute honor to have our guest today. Folks, here we go. If you have concerns about your financial future, let's be honest, the world shapes your wallet. We're taking you behind the scenes to look at what's really happening in the real world. Inform, prepare, and empower. This is the Full Disclosure Podcast with your host, John McGregor. So before we get into it, and our special guest, don't forget to ring that bell below and hit subscribe. You don't want to miss future episodes, especially as we're coming to the new year, because I'm bringing specific guests like the guest we have today that will share with you specific things that you could be doing immediately to kick off 2024 in a very powerful and lucrative way. I also want to mention uh, my new cash flow masterclass is up on my website. It's roughly 35 minutes. I teach you a very simple wealth building strategy using stocks and options to generate instant cash flow on every single trade. And it's not day trading at all. It's a well proven strategy. I just codified into a step by step process that anyone can use with any background. But sadly, only 98% of people have no idea this strategy exists. It's a strategy where you can really, literally create a pension for life. So check it out on my website, and I think you'll find it very interesting. All right, let's get into it. It's an absolute honor and privilege for me to introduce my good friend, Tom Wheelwright, to the show. And I've known Tom for, I was thinking about this today, Tom, that's 12 years now. It's amazing how time has flown by. And most recently, Tom and I and a few others were traveling throughout Europe with Robert Kiyosaki on a speaking tour. And we had just an absolute blast together. Now, to say Tom is a CPA is a complete understatement when you consider what he actually does for people with their taxes. Tom is the chief executive officer of WealthAbility. He's a personal advisor to Robert Kiyosaki and the Rich Dad Organization. He's an entrepreneur, international speaker, best-selling author of this book, Tax-Free Wealth, How to Build How to Build Massive Wealth by Permanently Lowering Your Taxes. It's a great, great read. He's the host of two very popular podcasts. The first is Wealth, The Wealth Ability Show, and the second one is The Wealth Ability Show for CPAs. Tom does a lot of work with other CPAs, both mentoring and coaching CPAs around the world. He is the go-to guy for other CPAs. And most recently, Tom launched this book, which like his first, is phenomenal. And I would highly, highly recommend all of you pick up a copy. And this one is titled The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, Seven Investments the Government Will Pay You to Make. And this book gets into how to tax effectively invest in various areas that we're going to talk about today, including energy, real estate, agriculture, retirement accounts. He talks about how to use the tax code to buy things like cars and houses and, and your tuition bill. And I also love how Tom talks about the rich, why they aren't a drain on society, and how you can become one of them with the right tools. It's a great, great read. Something that I'm actually going to reread. You can already tell I've, 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 I've got all kinds of tabs in this one. I'm going to reread over the over the holiday season. All right, so Tom, welcome to the show. It's great to have you, and thank you so much for your time today. John, it's great to be with you. It's, it's about time we got on a podcast together because uh, we, we've been we've been doing this uh, on stage together for so Absolutely. long. Absolutely, no, it's it's great. Very timely, you're here, and uh, like I said, we had a blast in Europe. Um, so again, thank you. So Tom, why don't we start just share a little bit more about your background, more than I said, and um, kind of where your company is today and what you're doing. Yeah, so a little bit more. Um, I, I, I've been a tax nerd for over 40 years now and uh, started my career with Ernst & Young uh, coming out of a master's of tax program at uh, um, from the uh, University of Texas in Austin. And I spent seven years there, including three years in the National Tax Office in Washington, D.C. I was an adjunct professor in the master's of tax program at Arizona State University for 14 years. I was the in-house tax advisor for a Fortune 1000 company and uh, uh, started my first CPA firm from scratch, literally with two clients. Mm -hmm. And we built to a large uh, CPA firm and then sold that firm uh, because we decided that that was too small of a world for it. We wanted to start affecting a lot more people. You know, like uh, Robert always says, right? The 
the uh, the job um, a job well done really just means that it's time for a bigger right. job. So uh, so what we did was we launched a network for uh, CPAs, particularly tax advisory mm -hmm. CPAs. And uh, recently we launched a franchise. Wow. So we have about 10 franchisees so far, and we expect to be um, up to 100 by the end of next year of tax advisory franchisees, primarily CPAs. Um, I am a big fan of the CPA profession. I think CPAs are the best trained tax advisors. They're not all tax advisors, which is important to remember that not all CPAs are tax advisors, but a tax advisor that's not a CPA is missing something. Okay, so what you want is a tax advisor who is a CPA, CPA who's a tax advisor, um, because that way they're actually focusing on how to reduce your taxes, not just how to prepare your taxes um, so that you, you know, don't get audited. So to say you circle the globe in the tax industry is basically... That's actually an understatement, right? I mean, you've seen it all, which is just awesome. Um, so uh, why don't we start with this book? Because I love this book. Like I said, I'm going to read it again. You know, you 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 wrote this tax-free wealth book, which was very successful. What what drove you to write this book? Well, actually, what you were talking about, I, I just saw so much. There was so much discussion over the last couple of years about how uh, the wealthy don't pay any tax and they don't pay their fair share and, and they're bad because they're wealthy. And I'm just going, yeah, that's not how the world works, folks. And, and so I wrote tax free wealth for everybody who just is tired of paying taxes and just, they don't need any convincing. They just don't want to pay tax. They just want to do it legally. Um, I wrote win-win wealth for people who are unsure whether it's okay to lower their taxes, hmm. if tax, if reducing your tax is actually an okay thing. And, and what I wanted to show is that, look, um, you reduce your taxes best by doing what the government wants you to do. So if, if you think about the tax law, think of it as a series of incentives. And it's incentives to do things that the government wants you to do. For example, why do you put money into a 401k? Well, okay, you probably get an employer match, which is good but you probably wouldn't do it at all if you didn't get a tax deduction for it. So that's the incentive for you to save for retirement. Um, we know people save better for retirement when they have a tax benefit than if they don't have a tax benefit. And that's why they did it. But this actually started, John, back in the uh, 60s. Um, it was done before that, but primarily in the 60s with JFK. And he uh, wanted to stimulate manufacturing. And so what he did was he said, well, we're going to do a tax credit, which is a dollar for dollar for uh, manufacturers who add equipment um, to their manufacturing facilities. And lo and behold, it worked. And so then every president since then, and by the way, now, in fact, in win-win wealth strategy, i do charts and tables for 15 different countries, as you mm -hmm. know. And what I, because I want to show is this is not a U.S. phenomenon. This is something that every country has these incentives. And it, it, it was remarkable. I mean, it literally, um, it, it shocked me how similar the tax laws were when I did all, when I did the research um, for the 15 different countries, John. And it's really, is just, all it's saying is, look, if you want to know what the government wants done, look at their tax mm -hmm. law. And um, one of the things I'll just add to that bef before we keep going here is, you know, if you, if you make money, the more money you make, the more tax you pay. But the more wealth you build, the less tax you pay. And so really the tax law is actually built to help you build wealth. And so wealthy people, not people who make a lot of money, but wealthy people should not be paying a lot of tax because that's how the tax law is set up. Because what the government wants is, it's, it's those wealthy people that are investing their money back into the economy. Because if you save money or you spend money, you pay, get, pay tax on it. But if you reinvest the money, you don't pay tax on it. And all the government's saying is, reinvest it, and we won't take tax out of it as long as you keep reinvesting. No, that's brilliant. I mean, and by the way, I've been on stage with, I've been, we've been around the world together and I, we hear that comment all the time. Tom, you can't do that here. You can't do that in this country, right? <laughs> and your response is, Every of course time. you can, you know, it might be, there might be some minor tweaks here, but you said, like you say, these tax laws are universal. And I love how you yeah. say that the tax code is an incentive, basically. It's incentivizing people to make investments, um, and, and, and grow the economy, right? But most people don't see that. Most people see the IRS as this evil agency that's just trying to steal their money. 
there, you could make an argument there are some of that 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 does exist to some exa- to some extent. But if people understood how the tax code works, that's why your books are so important. You can eliminate or minimize taxes altogether, right? Yeah, for sure. It's tax-free wealth, not tax-reduced wealth, yeah. right? So um, there's a reason. That's that's the name of the book. Um, y- you know, people are uh, people should be afraid of the IRS. <laughs> I don't get why to get you wrong. The IRS is not your friend. Um, Congress is. So Congress writes the laws. The IRS doesn't write the laws. The, the IRS makes sure that you're not overstepping the bounds of the law. That's the IRS's job. Now they. I think they go too far, but that's a that could be a different discussion. Yeah. Um, they 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 do. They're they're uh, lately um, over the last six or seven years they've been pretty heavy handed, um, where I think they've actually taken the law into their own hands. Yeah. But um, that said, uh, there Congress is very favorable towards taxpayers in many 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 ways. Um, uh, and, and let me give you the most simple example. How many of uh, if, you, if all the listeners that you have on this show, John, how many of them own their own home? And I would guess it's a very yeah, large proportion. Majority. Yeah. Okay. When you, when you bought that home, tell me you didn't factor in the tax benefit of that interest deduction. Everybody does. Should I, should I rent or should I buy? Well, if I rent, I get no tax deduction. If I buy, I get a tax deduction. So now all of a sudden... The, the, even though your payment might be bigger for a home than it is for rent, after taxes, it could be less than rent. And that's the incentive because what, what the government decided many, many years ago is we have a more stable population if they own homes. And, and that's, I mean, that's where savings and loans came from in the, in the thirties and forties. That's where, um, you know, that's where the interest action, that's where Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac came from. I mean, all of these government agencies to encourage people to own homes and the biggest incentive to own a home is the tax benefit. Of course. Yeah. And I love what you said earlier about the rich don't pay their fair share, right? We hear that all the time. The media loves to say the rich don't pay their fair share, but correct me if I'm wrong. Don't the top one percent of earners pay forty percent of all taxes in the top? Tw- I think it's more. I, I actually think it's more really? than that. Um, uh, uh, yeah, the 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 rich. Let me put it this way. <laughs> So 50% of the public doesn't pay taxes, doesn't pay any tax, yeah. right? Um, which, of course, Mitt Romney got killed for that when he was running for president because he he called it out and he just said, look, 50% of you don't pay tax. And people were like, well, that's horrible. That, you know, how, how dare you say that we don't pay tax? Well, you don't. <laughs> I mean, it is the fact, right? Um, the rich pay... The largest share of tax. I mean, really, they pay a large share. Now, I'm not saying that they couldn't afford to pay more tax. I'm, I'm not. I, I'm not going to comment. I'm not one to comment on. Well, the rich should or should not pay more taxes. That that's a social policy is, issue, and and I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, a sociologist major. Um, but what what I do think is that the rich do pay a, a lot of tax, and. Where what I find interesting is most of the cheating is done by the middle class. It's not done by the rich. And uh, the IRS is actually finding that out right now because they've got some audit programs. Um, so they're auditing large partnerships and they're auditing uh, wealthy people and they're having a tough time finding money. And why, why is that? Well, because the rich can afford advisors like me who know how to... Le- excuse me, legally reduce their taxes. So if they can afford advisors like me to legally reduce their taxes, why would they ever cheat? Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, I'm not saying there aren't rich people who cheat. I'm sure there are, okay? But I remember, for example, when Donald Trump's uh, tax returns were released, which I thought thought the person who did that should be in prison for 20 years. I agree. but uh, instead of getting his hand slapped, um, but I, I looked at those tax returns. I couldn't resist, of course. <laughs> and there's, I mean, really what came out of that, if you know, if I don't know if you remember, they came out in December. Yeah. By January 1st, the story was done. And the reason is because they had a lot of high powered people look at it and say, yeah, there, there's no there there. I mean, he just did what the tax law says you can do. In fact, I will tell you, he lost a ton of deductions. He actually needed a better tax advisor. Wow. Um, I, I can honestly say that. He, and, and in fact, what's interesting is we say, well, Donald Trump reduced taxes. But, you know, uh, because of Trump's tax law um, in 2020, 
two. I think I've got that right because the, the I think the the uh, the returns they released went through 2020, right? I think in 2022, I think he was uh, he had to pay like five million dollars in tax, and recently he had to pull money out to pay tax, and that's because the tax law he enacted actually put a tax on the rich. Wow. So you know, it's, it's kind of. Um, I, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to set the record straight. That's all I'm trying to do, John. No, I appreciate that. It's absolutely amazing. I love that story. You know, the left was salivating, the media was salivating over his tax returns. They absolutely were convinced that Trump was was stealing from the IRS and stealing from the government. And then it was just zilch, nothing. Goose egg. I that was just classic. And my one of my favorites was when he was debating Hillary on stage, right? I remember <laughs> that, of course. And I think you, you write oh, about yeah. it in your book when Hillary's you know, basically calling, you know, or the interview was, was, uh, do you use these deductions? He goes, yeah, because I'm smart. It's the tax code that you guys created. I'm just using it in my favor. And, and, and that was like the nail in the coffin or one of the nails in the coffin for Hillary. I thought that was classic. Um, so, so Tom, for people listening out there, we've got a lot of W2 employees. We've got a lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners. What can these people be doing now to lower or minimize or even eliminate their tax bill. And let me just add to that. What, what about W-2 employees? And, you know, just what do you say to those people? Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I'll give you a couple of rules here. Um, first of all, uh, when you when you go to a tax advisor, that and, and if you don't ask yourself these questions, but your advisor should be asking you three questions. And um, the first one is, how do you make your money? Because how you make your money is going to have an impact on how much tax you pay. You know, you've heard me say this a dozen times from stage is that, um, you know, if you make your money as a professional investor, you probably won't pay tax. I mean, when they talk about all the, they, 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 they keep talking about this wealth tax. Well, why are they talking about that? Well, because the professional investors aren't paying tax. That's why, because that's the way the tax law is built. I mean, whether you're a professional stock investor, stock trader, or whether you're a professional real estate investor, the laws are pretty close to the same. You don't, you're just not going to pay mm -hmm. tax. That's, that's the way it's going to be. So, so how you make your money and W2 employees are going to just from a, how you make your money standpoint, they're going to pay a high tax rate. Okay. And that is true all over the world. The next question is, what are you going to do with your money? And I do hear tax advisors ask the first question, but I've literally never heard any other tax advisor besides myself and my franchisees um, talk about what are you going to do with your money? Because that's actually goes to the win-win wealth strategy, right? Those seven investments, mm -hmm. because what you do with your money has a much bigger impact on how much tax you pay than how you make your money, because you can actually make your money and, and have a high tax rate, like as a small business owner. So I can take a small business owner who might start out with a 50 to 60% tax rate. And I can turn that small business owner into somebody who pays a tax rate of wow. zero. Now, that's not common. They have to do everything I tell them to do. And one of the things I always tell people is, if you want to change your, fa your tax, you have to change your facts. So my job um, and, and the job of our franchisees is to give you a choice. So you have a choice. So for example, um, let's say that you said, uh, I, had a, I had a client come to me a number of years ago. He said, I, my wife and I love traveling to New Mexico. He lived in um, Southern Arizona. He said, my wife and I love traveling to New Mexico. Could we, um, could we deduct our travel? And I said, okay, so let me tell you how to deduct your travel. So that's another thing um, everybody should remember. The question is not, can I deduct it? But how do I deduct it? Different question, different result. So I said, yes. Yeah. So here's what you have to do. When you go to New Mexico and he was in the construction business, he was doing real estate. When you go to, to New Mexico, you need to spend um, four and a half hours a day out of an eight hour workday. You need to four, spend four and a half hours a day uh, actually doing your real estate business. And if you do that, then your trip's going to be deductible. So a couple of months later, he came back and we were having our, a meeting in, in my office and he goes, so I did everything you said. I said, he said, is it, do I get the deduction? And he was very excited about it. And I said, yeah, you do. And he said, I, I said, well, how much, you know, let's look at how much you travel a year. And we figured out it's saving about $4,000 a year. And I'm going, you are way too excited about this for $4,000. This is a guy who made a lot of money. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, here's what happened. Well, we went to New Mexico and because I was looking for real estate, I found a deal. 
And this deal is going to net me about a million dollars. So that's the incentive of the tax law working. It's saying, look, you go do what we want you to do. You're going to go find this property. Now, you know, he he could have gone 20 times, you know, before he found a property, but he turned out he found it the first time he finds this property on that million dollars. He's going to pay $300,000 of tax. Mm -hmm. So the government traded $4,000 of tax benefit for $300,000 $300,000 of tax. That's a pretty good deal for the government. So it's not just the government, it's not just the taxpayer that wins with these incentives. The government wins huge. In fact, if you look at uh, Win Win Wealth, I actually do an analysis in every single chapter on every mm-hmm. investment. The only, uh, the only one of the seven where the government doesn't win more than the taxpayer is in retirement savings. That one, the government breaks even. Interesting. But Every other one, whether you're talking about energy or business or real estate or, or um, agriculture, uh, yeah, agriculture, wh- whatever it is, the government wins bigger than the taxpayer. I mean, in fact, John, I I promise you, if you could, <laughs> if you could be an investor with every business startup, if you could actually go in and be an investor with every single business startup, and you got a lifetime of revenue from it. As long as that business was in play, would you do that deal? All day long. All day long. Well, that's all the government's yeah. doing. I mean, all the government's saying is, look, we're your partner. You don't get to choose whether we're your partner, but you do get to choose what kind of partner you are with us. You can be a silent partner or you can be an active partner. So you can actively participate, do things we want you to do, or you can be a silent partner and pay tax. We don't care. That's amazing. In fact, I was just going to bring that up in your book. You talk about you are basically any taxpayer is a partner with the government. So, Tom, those three things, just to recap, how you make your money, what do you do with your money? And then what was the third? <laughs> and the third one. Oh, see, there you go. That's why you always have to have a third one. So I I, I got you on that one. <laughs> um, the third one is the third one you'll love. What are you going to do with your money when you ah. die? Um, and, and the reason that's important is because there are ways to reduce your taxes that are dependent on what are you going to do with your money when you die? And this is something I've, I, I literally have conversations with an attorney probably once a year. I'll find an attorney that I'm talking to him about it. I, I remember this one attorney and I'm telling, telling him what, what we did with the estate plan in order to reduce their income tax. And he looked at me, he goes, and this is a guy who was a really good estate yeah. planner. He goes, that would absolutely work. <laughs> How come I've never thought of that? <laughs> I, I, I feel like you, you've, you've had those conversations a lot, Tom. <laughs> that's good. So, yeah, that's the, that's the third Excellent. one. What are you going to do with your money when you, you die? You know, I got to just back up. You know, one of the most important lessons I've learned from you, Tom Wheelwright, years ago, is a shift in, the, in, in your thinking in the paradigm, in, in, in the paradigm thinking, is asking yourself not, can I uh, deduct this, but how can I deduct this? And as simple as that sounds, that was so profound for me. And I know you've said it on stage a million times, but that really sunk in. It's a totally different way of thinking about things, right? Well, yeah, think about same. So, so let's go back to our client that went to New Mexico, right? What he had now was a choice. Now he didn't, if he, if he didn't want to spend four and a half hours a day doing, um, doing real estate while he was in New Mexico and he just wanted to, you know, sit around the hotel pool, then he didn't, then he he wouldn't deduct the trip, but that now he has a choice. But until we have, until we have the knowledge, until we have the, the financial education, we have no choice. We just have to do what somebody tells us our, our accountant is telling us to do or what we know of and and ignorance is very expensive mm-hmm. well said so can we talk just a couple of examples of those investments i, I do want to talk about the 401k you write about yeah. it in chapter eight and then maybe you could pick one maybe it's real estate or oil and gas and how that actually lowers people's uh tax um obligations well, well, first thing is, uh, so in, in uh, chapter two, which is business, because business is first because it is always okay. first. Um, in every tax law, business has the most tax okay. benefits. And in fact, all of the other tax benefits um, 
are there because you have a business, right? You actually get them because you're in business uh, in some sort, whether you're in energy business, whether you're in the real estate business, whether you're in the agriculture business, um, or whether you have a business and contribute to a retirement plan, right? You still, I mean, you the, the business is kind of the foundation. So every, anybody who doesn't have a business ought to really be, really be thinking about a side hustle. Um, I actually give an example in chapter yeah. two of Win and Wealth where the government literally... Um, you are better off financially having started the business than before you started the business without any revenue because the tax benefits are greater than the cost of starting the wow. business. And it's like, that's like a too good to be true thing. And you go, really? And I'm going, so read chapter two and you'll see that. So business is number one. But let me give you one that I, I, I really want to address here, which is um, energy and particularly renewable mm -hmm. energy because that's the big catchword right now, right? Renewables, renewables, renewables. Um, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of renewables. I have solar on my, on my uh, studio. I have solar on my, my office building. You know, the one thing I know for sure is we're going to get 300 plus days of sun in Arizona. So solar works in Arizona and a lot of places, solar works. And what the government does is if you do it on a business or your rental real estate, your investment property, um, then not only do you get a 30% tax credit for the cost, but this year it's a 65% deduction. Wow. So, so let's say you got, you put a hundred thousand dollars on your, on your office building, you get $30,000 off the top and then a $65,000 deduction, which is probably worth another $30,000 to you, which means you're only putting in $40,000 and the government's putting in 60. Well, it basically almost triples your return on investment and and you're getting retail retail prices really because now your business isn't paying the utility bill. So, I actually calculated on my on my office building, my return on investment's right around 22%. Wow. Just 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 because the government put in most of the money. Folks, I, ho I hope you're hearing this. I mean, this is just amazing information. It's all right in front of you. And Tom, this isn't rocket science, right? Get a hold of this book and it lays it out step by step. And I'm not, and by the way, <laughs> there's no commission in book sales for me, folks. <laughs> I'm trying to help you. <laughs> Actually, there's no, as, as John knows, there's no money in there's book sales There's definitely either. no money in book sales, trust me. <laughs> unless, unless you wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad, right? And then there's lots of money, but unless you're the number one seller of yeah, all time. I, I not, not Tom, my me. book's been out four years now. I think I just broke even on all the costs. <laughs> so, there right. you go. There you go. See, I, I, I understand that. Um, I, I, I totally get that. I, 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 I'm sure on Win Win Wealth, I, it will be a couple of years before I break even on that <laughs> one. Yeah. Um, but you know what? The important thing is to, it, what, what's important is get, getting that message out, right? That That's what's important. And so, um, John, you're right. It's The concepts are not that difficult. Now, you do need a good tax yeah. advisor because... The details are that difficult, but the concepts are not. And what's important is, remember, every dollar you make has some tax consequence to it, and every dollar you spend has some tax consequence to it. And so what you want is you want the dollars that come in to be taxed at a lower rate and the dollars that go out to be deductible. And that's really why I say, you know, that deduction, and it, really anything can be yeah. deductible. So, we, or the cost of anything can be deductible. In fact, I in chapter nine, which I thought was going to be your favorite chapter. Uh, I, I know it's, I know it's Ken. No, Ken it is, favorite it, chapter. It, that is my favorite chapter. I know where you're going with this. How to, how to get the government to pay <laughs> exactly. for your Ferrari. No, that and and what's what's great about that chapter is that is a true story that I tell, and those are real numbers from a real oh, and client. You and you break um, it down in you, detail how he got the government to pay for his uh, Ferrari. Absolutely. It's a great story. And, and I got to tell you, John, this I mean I owe all that to Robert because the very the most important thing I think the very most important thing I first learned from Robert was that if you want. If you want a doodad, you need to buy an asset to pay for the doodad. And, and then, you know, when you add then the tax benefits on top of that, oh my heavens, then literally, literally the government pays for your Ferrari. So it's a, it, it's a pretty, that's a, that's a pretty fun chapter, but let's, let's talk about your foreign yeah, case yeah. because I will tell you the most surprising thing for me that came out of writing that book, as I'm sure you're aware. Yeah, you told me this. <laughs> is that, <laughs> 
is that four hundred one ks actually work tax wise. That they they do, and um, I I've had to swallow my pride because for years and years I said it makes no sense to defer your taxes because you're just you know, it's like eating your vegetables at the end of the meal. They're just cold and nasty. So, you know, don't, don't do that. Um, the reality is for, uh, particularly for employees, you asked what employees can do. Um, I actually think from a tax standpoint, the most important thing they do is they, they, um, if they're going to invest their money in the stock market, the best way to do that tax wise is through a 401k or an IRA or pension plan. And of course I think, better than a regular 401k is a Roth, um, but w w some type of a 401k or, a, or an IRA or a, or a pension plan. And the reason is, and I'll make it really simple for everyone. When so we have a progressive tax rate structure, which means the last dollar you earn is taxed at your highest rate. Okay, but even Warren Buffett has a 10% tax rate. He has a 12% tax rate. He has a 0% tax rate. He gets the standard deduction like everybody else. Okay, so we all have those tax brackets. Well, if the last dollar you earn is taxed at the highest rate, the, the first dollar of deduction is deducted at the highest mm -hmm. rate. So that means that let's say you're in a 30% tax bracket. Okay, but that you're not 30% for all of your income, you're only 30% of the top amount of your income. Okay, so that $10,000 that you put into your 401k, that deduction is 30%, which means you got you saved $3,000, okay? Which hopefully meant you can put $13,000 in your 401k instead of 10,000, right? You didn't, uh, or you meant you put more away. Okay, now, when you take that money out, remember the first $10,000 you take out, in fact, right now, um, it's about the first $17,000, it's tax-free because you have a um, you, you have a standard deduction. It's up to $27,000 for married, finding, joint. So you have $27,000 of tax-free income. So that the income that comes out actually comes out at a aggregate lower rate, even if it's the same amount mm -hmm. of money because it all came off your highest rate, but it's coming out at an aggregate rate. And so it, the math does work. I run the math because you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to be transparent here. I, I did not believe that math until I ran the math. Yeah, we've had some heated debates on the Rich Dad Radio Show, haven't we? We have. <laughs> we've gone around with Andy Tanner and me going at it. That's been great. But no, it's great that you share that because, you know, I defend the 401k not because it's a great retirement vehicle. It's because it's pretty much the only vehicle for most people. And most people are not going to start their own business. So if that's the only thing they, that, that's out there for, for most right. people, take advantage of it. Um, and, and, and that's why I take that position. Um, uh, I, I, I have to agree with you. I mean, here's the thing. If, if you're going to get all the financial education and you're going to, uh, uh, are there better investments um, than putting your money into an ETF? And you yeah, and I know, sure. there, I mean, you know, I mean, your, your, your own business is all, by the way, your own business will always be the best yeah. investment always. Okay. If you're good at it, you're going to make a lot more money at it than you ever do in any other kind of investment. And you'll get tax benefits on top of that. But if you're not, like you say, if you're an employee and, and you want to be the millionaire next yeah. door, right? I mean, let's take the millionaire next door. If that's, if that's your plan, then the 401k makes all yeah. the sense in the world because then you ought to be, because because now your goal is not to make a lot of money. Your goal is to not yeah. lose money, right? Warren Buffett, mm -hmm. right? The most important thing is to not lose money. And so that's, uh, you know, that's the whole idea of diversifying your portfolio so that you don't lose money. That's, that's the point of it. And so a 401k for somebody who's not going to look at these other, you know, the other six strategies, you know, this other six investments, if that's your, if that's your strategy, then a 401k makes sense. Awesome, Tom. Well, sadly, we are out of time, and um, I've got so many more questions I want to ask you, Tom, really about your business and success traits of people that you work with, mindset, and all those other things that really drive success. And I hope we can get to, get to that in another episode, if, if you don't mind joining us. Uh, um, do I, I, I do have one final question regarding the, the tax advisor. How does somebody find, because I've worked with so many CPAs that are just basically number data data dumpers. They take my data, put it into a computer, and then spit out my tax return. How do people find a tax advisor? Obviously, they could find someone who's a CPA, but there's, I, I, and I, 
I, there is a difference between a CPA and a tax advisor, I, I, right? I would, so I would start with I would start with if if you own a business now if you're a if you're a W two employee you don't need a CPA. You could do an, an enrolled agent, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and those people are less expensive and because you just don't have the, as many options, right? But if you're going to invest in real estate or, you, or you're going to invest in, in energy or agriculture or something else, or you're going to b- build your own business, you need mm-hmm. a CPA because the CPAs understand the numbers better. Um, so what you do is you start with the CPA, but now you have to interview the CPA and find out if they're a good tax advisor. So that's the, so the CPA is kind of the base, base benchmark, but there are a lot of CPAs who know nothing about tax and very few of them know what you and I are talking about. And so uh, good news is chapter 23 of Tax Free Wealth is how to find a good tax advisor. There we go. But I will tell you, I think the most important skill set, the most important skill of a tax advisor is to ask you good questions. Um, It's not for you, not to answer the questions because you're not going to know whether they are telling the whether they know what they're talking about, right? There's no way you don't know. If you knew the answer, you wouldn't ask them the question in the first place. But I do think that we're, for most people, we're pretty good at knowing when somebody is asking a good question. There are stupid questions, okay? Um, you know, like, what's the name of your dog? I'm sorry, but who cares, right? And it, it, it's just, let me ask you questions about, and, and again, I think they ought to be asking those three questions. How do you make your money? What what are you going to do with your money? And what are you going to do with your money Perfect. when you die? And if they don't ask those three questions, then don't ask, don't, don't talk to them about it because if they didn't ask the question. That's they're never going to ask the question. So, <laughs> you know, I, I've had I've had people tell me, well, I gave my, my tax free wealth to uh, my my uh, tax advisor, and he said, well, yeah, of course you can do that. And I'm going, well, why didn't exactly. he do it then? Exactly. So. So last thing I will tell you, John, um, and I'll let you go, is uh, you want the easy button, go to wealthability.com, and we will find you there we go. the right CPA. And I train them. This is why we have a franchise. And, um, and in fact, uh, we'll make, I'll, I'll, I'll make an offer to all your listeners, John. You go to wealthability.com, you click on schedule a consultation, and we'll actually give you a second opinion on your tax returns and see how you're doing. And we won't, we won't charge you for that second opinion, for that analysis. Wow, Tom, that's a huge offer. I mean, talk about a no-brainer. Everyone listening should take advantage of this. This is huge. I, I, I would guarantee, Tom, how many people do you think are leaving money on the table or paying too much in taxes? My experience, 95 to 98%. Folks, wealthability.com, schedule your consultation, get your tax reviewed. You're leaving a lot. You're wasting a lot of money that you could be putting back in your pocket or no other investments. So thanks so much, Tom. I really, really appreciate it. Just a ton of great information. Really, really thank you. Thanks, everyone. Always a blast. Yeah, we're going to definitely have you back if you don't mind. Always a blast. Again, don't forget to hit subscribe. You don't want to miss out on our year-end episodes. Lots of good Good interviews coming up like we just had with Tom. Please leave a comment. It's always great getting your feedback, your ideas, suggestions for other topics that you want to hear about. As always, have a great weekend. Aloha. Thanks for listening and supporting Full Disclosure. If you like this episode, remember to like and subscribe and follow Full Disclosure. To make a better financial plan for your future, join our Cashflow Bootcamp, where John shows you a safe and smart way to turn your investments into a steady income stream in a fraction of your time. Learn to make money in any market. Until next time.